Welcome back designers. Today we're going to talk about logos as you can see. Um, you've already had a lecture on branding and we will have talked about it in class a little bit and now we're diving more uh, specifically and deeper into um, logos as part of a brand. All right so without further ado a logo as you already know because you mastered the branding lecture is a unique identifying symbol. Well, the term logo is the most commonly accepted term to describe what this is. Other terms are sometimes used are um, symbol or mark or brand mark or identifier or trademark. Now one of the main characteristics of a logo or what it should do is provide immediate recognition. With one glass, glance rather the average person should be able to recognize and assess a brand or group by looking at its logo. A logo represents and embodies everything a brand, group, or individual signifies. Remember when we talked about branding, the logo is one element that creates the brand, but it's the most significant element. We talked about all these things about Starbucks, but it's that logo that really is the cement that holds it all together. Here's an example with Apple. Um, because it's responsible for conveying the overall message about the brand and the brand's quality, it is an ambassador, if you will, representing the brand. The logo's message is reinforced through marketing, package design, advertising. FYI, remember this for when we get deeper into Project 4 or into Project 4, um, your branding project. The logo is the jumping off point for a larger, broader brand identity as we've seen here with several of these target examples. So anyway, let's get back to logos for a second. A logo on its own is, or it should, tell a visual story. It's the story distilled, meaning it's, it's, it's um, reduced down to its most significant or most important elements, compressed into one unit, if you will. Now there are a variety of logo categories. Now these are these are to help you just sort of start looking at logos and taking them apart um, to understand what the designer did. This isn't anything someone's. Well, it might be. Uh, they're going to come back and say, "Make me a," you know, a, "This is we." This is called a word mark. Very often. Um, it's sometimes called a logo type, but that gets confusing because it gets confused with the entire logo. But a word mark, which think of the, the word word mark, uh, basically is a logo where the word is the most important graphic element. The name is often spelled out in a unique topography or some kind of um, distinctive lettering. So that'd be a word mark. And that is the first kind of logo. Um, and it's, it's very popular. Now a letter mark, not to be confused with a word mark, a letter mark is often created using the initials of a brand name, as we see here. And in the case of like MICA at the bottom, that's, that's what the organization is known as at this point, as MICA. Up Maryland Institute of Creative Arts, I believe. See, I don't even know because I always call it MICA. Okay, so another kind of a logo is a pictorial symbol logo, which uses a representational image, which basically just means something that is real or something that you can recognize, um, an identifiable person, place, activity, or object. You see in all of these. Similar but different is a symbolic logo, which is um, uses imagery as well, but the imagery is less representational. Wouldn't go so far as to call it abstract, because that's another category coming up, because these, um, I mean, that's, that's a house, that's a coffee cup, but the style of it is done in a less um, literal way. And these can be sometimes um, combined with the logo type, Perks, Rummage, Orphan Society, Acorn, um, and sometimes not, but usually with, because only organizations like Target can afford to just have two circles and us know who they are. Speak of the devil, here's abstract. These are purely invented. They're not derived from anything. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're just shapes. Um, uh, does not relate to any object in nature or literally represent a person, place, or a thing. 
often they try to capture the essence of a company. In TransLink, maybe that's movement. Sometimes it's flexibility. Sometimes uh, the third one from the left, light flow, um, showing getting smaller. Like it, you, they might be saying, they they um, they look at the details. They look you know, big picture and the small picture. Um, and these are these are very popular. Um, not that the other ones aren't, but um, a lot of times a company doesn't want to be linked to one thing. They want to keep it a little bit open for people's um, own uh, interpretation. These two would be a hybrid of letter form and symbol. They use the letters of their organization like a letter form, but they do it in a more symbolic way. And the H is probably the best example of that. Uh, character icons very big, very often with um, groups or organizations that have a little more money to spend. I can see with Aflac and the bunny. So those are styles. The following are a little bit more, less about the content of the logo, symbolic, pictorial, whatever, and more how it's configured, more the layout of the logo. For example, these are what I would call self-contained logos or self-contained units. Um, you can start thinking of a logo format as a closed unit based on basic shapes. Um, so the letters almost become um, just more shapes that work with the other elements in the design. It's not the best example, but the mermaid in, the way the letters are inside the mermaid, it's a, it's a nice kind of um, um, marriage of type with image. These, I would say, would be more, quote, breaking the unit. They are breaking out of the shape. You can't easily draw like a box around these like you, you can with, oops, I'm messing myself up with my, there I am with my, my fancy uh, fades. Um, all those, you could put a, a square or rectangle around any of them and that would contain the logo. Whereas, once again, these uh, are breaking, breaking out, which, you know, for, for example, um, the second two logos are both um, aeronautic um, engineering type companies that that's part of what they're trying to say, that they break the mold, that they're not the same old, same old. These are what I would call a free form logo. Unlike the first group, um, these are not contained by a rigid outer definable uh, boundary or shape, like an oval or square, you can't easily draw one of those, I mean you can, but it gets to be gigantic, um, and yet it still holds together on its own um, as a logo, as a logo unit, just much more freeform. And today, logos need to be flexible, so very often you'll have several elements, um, let's just say the one on the top, you've got those those three colors and the circle with the CF in it, there might be another version of that that is more vertical. There might be one that's more horizontal where they move those elements around, but because they are using the same elements and those elements are identifiable and memorable, um, it holds together as a family of logos. Some other factors to consider when you're deciding how to approach your logo is just the overall look. Um, you're doing a zoo, like how can you do that? Well, you could do uh, flat silhouetted animals like here. You could do simple line drawing. You could do something uh, much more 3D looking like Sony Ericsson did with, for, for that product. Um, I mean, this would be a better example if I had a really high high contrast, high um, super 3D, um, almost computer game looking logo with animals on it to show a different way to represent animals. I'm just bad at my examples. So once you choose the what, in this case, the animals, the zoo, the type, it's time to consider the how. Um, how are you gonna depict these shapes? Like I, I've already kind of just went through that. Can be more linear based, using line as the main element to depict and describe the forms. This can be as simple as um, the Hamilton or as complicated as Lame as a Rob. High contrast is a great way to go because it extreme high contrast of light and dark um, reduces a recognizable image to um, very simple components. Um, and 
less is always going to be more with a logo um, in terms of how to, to reproduce it, in terms of people mem uh, remembering it. Uh, once again, we don't want people to ever work harder than they need to. Um, yeah, this is a closer in style to hopefully we'll have done the um, in-class simplification exercise, uh, exercise 7a, um, by the time we've gotten to this lecture. Volumetric, we've already been through this with the Sony Ericsson, but that's what you would call it, uh, volume. They use value, remember value from our, our uh, elements of design. Um, use value to create this 3D form. And I just stuck that little thing on the left just to show you when I'm talking about value, the midtone, shadow, highlight. You can use texture or pattern, lines or marks to suggest form, light, texture, pattern, or tone using hatching, cross hatching, cross contouring, dots, smudges, on and on. Just to try to give you just some inspiration for how far you can go with a logo. Um, okay, now we're going to talk briefly about basic typographic considerations for a logo, or a little bit like um, what are the rules, what are the things you should do and not do. Uh, a big rule, big, 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 big rule is legibility. I can't read any of these. You can see that second one says fonts hard to read. Amen. Would not recommend any of these to anyone. Legibility is very important. Connotation or appropriateness of um, of the right voice, um, making sure that your logo matches the product or the organization is critical. Um, for example, both of these could work. I would say if I was doing a movie about ancient Rome, I wouldn't want to use the one on the bottom, probably the one on the top. I mean, I did this originally to show that the one on the bottom is wrong. Like you just, that's that kind of script, kind of retro script font doesn't really work for ancient Rome. However, if I was opening like a kind of cheesy retro Italian restaurant, you know, maybe that font would work. Just be aware of what your logo, logo type, logo elements are communicating and do they match your product or your organization. Uniqueness and distinction are important for a logo. Um, often, particularly looking at the one on the bottom, um, the, the visual play, which actually I didn't realize until recently that that's also supposed to be a woman's face with bangs as well as a bowl. Um, a little racist, but okay. And um, I don't think movers are supposed to be anything different. It's just a use of um, positive and negative space, but it's certainly unique. It's not you know, a bunch of guys on a truck. It stands out. Here's four logos for lawn care, and they're all, they all show grass, which is what lawn care does. But I give it up to King of Grass for at least using a different color to go beyond the green palette. And that means, you know, I was looking at the four of these on a board together, like we are. Uh, that's the one I think I would gravitate towards. Although I do think the one Thomas Longcare is a nice logo. Um, that color, it just really sets them apart. Your logo should work at a range of sizes and across all formats and media. I mean, that's, PPS is fabulous. Like it's tiny, you can still tell what it is. And this was even before the days of having a Flavicon that you want to put, uh, uh, on your tabs on your, in your computer. And I think this is the last slide. The logo should work well in black and white as well as color. And this is where I'm going to stop um, for logos part one. Look for logos part two coming soon to a YouTube channel near you. Thanks for listening.